Amen. I love America. You know, when I was young, I used to think I'd like to visit Australia. I always thought that'd be a beautiful place to go to and the wild and all that it was. The older I get, the more I want to stay right here. Amen. I love this great nation. I don't love what I see happening to it, but I do love America. Amen. Well, last week we were in Zephaniah. This week we're in Haggai. And it's the next book after Zephaniah. As you remember, Zephaniah had three chapters, and so we're going to Haggai, it's only got two chapters. Uh, so uh, if you can find your place, it's Haggai chapter 1. We'll be preaching from there. You know, we in America need to learn from the Old Testament what happened to the Jews. Uh, Israel, God's chosen people, and how they fell. We need to learn from those there and do our best not to make the same mistakes to keep America like uh, God would want it to be. A God-fearing nation, one that loves uh, Him. And also, <coughs> y'all forgive me, I don't know. It seems like anymore my voice don't want to act like it should. But we're going to try it, right? Haggai, if you've got Haggai chapter 1, stand to honor the reading of the Word of God, and we'll read verse 1 through 4. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto the Zerubbabel, the son of Shilti, Shilti governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speak the Lord of hosts, saying, The people say, The time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie away? Let's pray today. Brother Tony, good to see you back. You doing okay? I'm doing fine. You're good enough to pray though, right? Yes. Pray for me, please. Can I pray sit down? Yes, sir. Yes, You're good. God. Yeah. Father, we do thank you for another opportunity to come to your house today. We thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this day that we celebrate, this weekend that we celebrate, remembering the patriots that died protecting our great country that you bless us with. God, I pray that the ones that are in churches today uh, throughout the land, that they'll remember what the celebration is about, and the ones that are out on the beaches and in the uh, fishing boats and wherever. Lord, I pray that they will at least take time to think what a great sacrifice so many people made. Yeah. Lord, I pray that you bless us now and we break the word of life that Lee shared with us and that we apply our lives that we might be better equipped to face the evil of this world. Uh, God, we thank you for all the good things you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks for making see me. Now last week, if you remember, we talked about Zephaniah being a minor prophet. And so we come to Haggai, and it's a minor prophet. And remember, minor and major only speak for the size of the book. Minor prophets are the smaller books. Major prophets are the larger books. But we've got Haggai, and uh, it's got two chapters. You know what? If you'll read Haggai, I think you'll find out that this book is filled with a lot of good teaching. A lot of good things. For a fact, uh, I see four good sermons I'm going to be preaching out here uh, over the next weeks and all. But he was a prophet. Uh, Haggai was a prophet during that time when uh, the Jews had uh, been in captivity to Babylon and then uh, some of them were allowed to come back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, to rebuild the temple and, and to inhabit that area again. And uh, he's a prophet during this period and all. In fact, God used three different prophets uh, during this period of time to speak 
to the Jews of that time. One was Haggai, the other was Zechariah, the other one was Malachi. And by the way, if you know the book of Malachi, you know that famous scriptures in there will a man rock God. And we've preached all that. And it's funny that God would have Malachi re to uh, speak about that subject to these Jews who have returned back and all. I'll tell you why God did it. God did the things he did because he was trying to get Israel, these Jews, back to where they once were in a right relationship with him. And I'll tell you what, God's always trying to get us back in a right relationship, isn't he? Have you ever noticed that on Sunday morning, you could be close to God, sitting in the house of God, but as soon as you leave here, the devil's all over you? And he'll get you all tripped up, fumbled up, and falling on your face, won't he? Well, God wanted the Jews to return to him. In fact, he let them go back. He told them, go back, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple and all. Now, in the scripture where Haggai comes in place, They've rebuilt the walls. They've got all the walls up. The people have built their homes. But the temple of God has only got a foundation. Nothing else has been built. None of the important things are there at this time. In fact, at the time of our scripture here, it's been 16 years since uh, these Jews built the walls until now. 16 years. They've been back in Jerusalem 16 years and the temple still lies in ruins. God sent them back to rebuild it. But they've been wasting time, haven't they? Have y'all ever been that way where you've wasted some time? You know you need to do something and you don't do it. And you always say, one day I'm going to get around to it. Uh, I'll get around to it. Oh, I'm sometimes not sure that's not where the Israelites are. Just wait the time to get around to it. And all. In fact, I will show you some of that in all. Now, God used Haggai and Zechariah to bring a message to these Jews. And the message simply is this. Rebuild the temple. Rebuild the temple. And that's what it does. If you went back to Ezra chapter 6, verse 14, you'll find that the elders of the Jews... I actually heard, by the way, Haggai fits in that book of Ezra. That's where you can put him at. You know? So if you ever read the book of Ezra, you can find Haggai's name mentioned. You can come back and read his prophecy to those Jews. But in that chapter 6, verse 14 of Ezra, you'll find that the elders of the Jews, they heard it. They listened to him. You know? And uh, they listened to that prophecy. Prophecy was simple. Rebuild the temple. Now, Haggai is saying, listen to what God says. Listen, we got to restore. We got to rebuild. We got to get back to what we once had, and so forth and all. You know, years ago, when I came to church here, this building only sat on one acre of land. And I went down to the city of Jacksonville at one time to get a permit to do some remodeling around here and take care of some things. And when I went down there, the city of Jacksonville and the zoning, the building department where you get all the permits, this, that, and the other. The guy told me, he says, you can't have a permit. I said, why? I said, you don't have enough land. I said, you now have to have four acres to have a church in Jacksonville, so we're not going to let you. I said, well, let me ask you this question. What if that church burns to the ground? Can we rebuild? He said, absolutely not. Unless you get more land. It is sad to stop the thing that if you don't have enough land, you can't have a church building. But you think about it. How would you have felt if this church building burnt to the ground and nothing was left but the rubble? Wrong, wrong. Broke your heart? Lost your temple? Israel's heart's not broken. They've been living 16 years without their temple. No place to go and worship. They're just living life and just going on. And guess what? They've left God. You know what destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem to start with? Israel left God. He no longer, they no longer had their protector. He allowed the Babylonians to walk in and destroy them and take them into captivity. It is strange 
that God would break down the barriers because his people left him? Well, I think what's strange is when a, per a people are God's chosen people, that they would turn their back on God and chase after an idol. Well, Haggai's talked to him, and uh, he's told about restoring the temple and all. And God's whole purpose behind this is restore worship. God wants them to return to him. God wants them to worship him. God wants them to put away the false gods, the false idols. He wants that relationship that he intended for them to have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. If you know anything about that church, you know that it was a worldly church. It was there in a place where there were so many different peoples and religions coming through that place that the church had allowed those things to enter into the church. And I'll tell you this, the church overall in America has allowed those things in. Amen. I've never, I've never seen churches today where their pastors or staff and all say it's okay to social drink. And I grew up in the church and I've grown up preaching. The Bible says, be ye not drunk with wine. And yet today I've even read where in the churches today that some people are teaching and leading in the church and yet they're living in adultery. Tells me something's wrong in America just like it was in Jerusalem. Didn't it? <clears throat> we got problems. You know? Well, Paul told them in that chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians 16, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Can I tell you, if sin is dwelling in our life and controlling our life and God has been pushed to the side, can I tell you, we're just like Jerusalem and our temple is broken. Our temple is broken down. We need to do something about it. Well, God calls the Jews to restore the temple and to worship Him. He calls them to do that. And uh, what they needed is what we need today. A spiritual revival. Amen. One amen. Yeah. That tells me we really need a spiritual revival. Amen. Right? Do you not know this? Can you not see that? Do you not see the need for a spiritual revival? Hmm? I mean, haven't we had in the past uh, a revival of church growth? Haven't we had revivals in our country where people loved America? I mean, we think, but uh, the real revival is a spiritual revival where God's children get right with Him, worship Him, and put him first in their life. That's what we need. That's what we need today. Well, whenever Haggai was given the message of God to them, and, and we looked at these first uh, four verses, and in the very first, very first four verses, God tells Haggai to point out what their problem is. Point it out. You know what their problem is? They were making excuses. And you know what Haggai says? He said, God told me to tell you, stop making excuses. Anybody here ever make excuses before? Huh? We've all made some excuses, haven't we? We've all made excuses. Well, uh, today's message is about stop making excuses. And I want to show you from the Word of God. Now, uh, I want you to see why they were making excuses. Now there's a lot of times why we make excuses, why we can't do things. But you know what their reason for making their excuse was? Basically they're discouraged. They're discouraged. These people have come back to Jerusalem and during the time of rebuilding the wall, do you remember they were told to wear their swords? Be ready to fight, but be ready to build and get to work. And the people around them were always telling them, oh, it won't last, it won't work. They tried to get them stop. And they just attacked them with words and brought about discouragement to the Jews in rebuilding the walls. But they were also being encouraged by their leader and being told, keep working, keep standing there, get the walls built so that we can have our protection. God is with us. God sent us here to do this. And 
It's an easy encouragement on one side, but on the other side, discouragement is coming from everywhere. <clears throat> discouragement ever get you down? Anybody here ever been discouraged? <laughs> well, some of y'all are lying when you put your hands up. <laughs> right? You're not going to tell me in your life, man, that you've not been discouraged over something. I want to ask you another question. I want you to think about it. I want you to be serious. How many of you are you discouraged today with something? Anything? Um, now, you understand what's going on? You see what's happening? Discouragement is on every hand. It's around us. Everywhere. It's right there. And uh, if you went back to Ezra in chapter 4 and you began to read over there in those first six verses, you'll find that we're being discouraged. But in that uh, first verse of Ezra 4, and I'm not going to go there and read it, but I want to read just one phrase out of it. It says, Now with the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. You understand? Judah and Benjamin are the Jewish people. Notice there it says, Now with the adversaries. That's their enemy. That's their adversaries. That's the people that came and tried to convince them to quit building, to quit doing this, and stop all those things. It's the adversaries who want them not build, not to build that temple. It's the adversaries that want them to quit. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter wrote these words: Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the same word. Your adversary, the devil. In the Old Testament, it's talking to the Jews about their adversaries. It comes to the New Testament, and Peter's writing to the church, and it tells them that we have an adversary. Can I tell you, the greatest <coughs> discouragement that we face is the one that the devil brings our way. Amen. He will discourage us. He is wanting to discourage us. In fact, Peter went on to say, he's like a roaring lion. He's walking about. He's seeking whom he may devour. I want to go ahead and tell you right now that if you're not discouraged by the devil today, he's going to come and do his best to discourage you in some way or another. Amen. He wants to. It's his desire. He's looking for Christians to destroy them all. Satan's also after the church as a whole. The church as a whole. The devil. Can I tell you? He wants to discourage King's Red Baptist Church. He wants to discourage the church of all saints. He wants to discourage us. Because see, if he can get the church to stop, the walls aren't being built. The temple's still laying flat. And nobody's worshiping God. And that's what he wants to do. Can I tell you when the devil gets riled up? The devil gets riled up when the church gets going. When the church starts doing something for God, boy, that bothers the devil. He gets all upset. Feathers are ruffled, and he comes after the church. And you know how he gets after the church? It starts with one person. He comes after one person. And he'll get that person discouraged. He'll get that person to lay out of church. He'll get that person to start talking bad about the church. He'll get that person to do everything they can to destroy that church. And guess what? It gets inside the church, and I, we can't help it. We'll hear it. We'll listen to it. And you know what? We'll get on the side of discouragement, and we'll start being a part of it too, won't we? Amen. Because that's the way the devil works. He don't like people who honor God. You don't like a church that gives God glory. You know, it don't take long. It doesn't take long for people to lose their zeal and become apathetic once they've been discouraged. Have you ever noticed that? Whenever, whenever we get discouraged, whenever the devil gets after us, we just kind of say, ho home. Why bother? Nobody else cares. I might as well be the same way. Isn't that what happens? They were discouraged. Now, the Jews listened to their adversaries. 
They did, and that's what happened. They got uh, to listening to the threats. They've got to see that opposition out there. They become discouraged, and they just quit. After they laid the foundation, they stopped. Threats. Let's think about the last year and a half of King's Road Baptist. Let's just talk about, think about the last year and a half of America or the world. Been any discouragement? Any kind? I think the church has been faced with discouragement. I think the devil has done everything he can to discourage us. We've had COVID, haven't we? And what do they tell us to do? Shut the church doors. Did that bother y'all? Man, it bothered me. I'm going to tell you, when COVID came out, I didn't know what to expect. Did any of y'all? I mean, we were told if we didn't stay home, we'd all get it and die. Right? I mean, we were just told that. And man, discouragement hit us like a ton of brains. And it hit our church. Man, we come in. You got to tell you, right now, I think when we started having parking lot services, we had more people then than we got today. Isn't that sad that now we can come to the church house, sit together, don't have to wear a mask, they have found that it's okay. But the discouragement is still there. Huh? Sure that discouragement is still there. We weren't able to gather back then and worship, and that discouragement hit us. It just took all over us. Attendance dropped off. Look around. We're 30 or 40 people shy of what we've been two years ago. Huh? Mm -hmm. And can I tell you, because I see the letters come in from the other churches and so forth, and I see people on Facebook and I run into them, can I tell you, I ain't but a handful of them going to the church anywhere or move their ministries. Yeah. They just quit. Mm -hmm. They're discouraged. Totally discouraged. And I'll tell you what's happened. It's taken a hold of this church, too. We're discouraged. I'll give you something else that'll really make you think about being discouraged. Southern Baptist churches across the board, the attendance is the lowest it's been since the early 1900s. More and more churches are closing their doors and some leaving the convention. They all it's getting worse. Now we can sit here and be discouraged and sit in our self pity, can't we? Or we can turn to Jesus. Right? Amen. We can look at the old rugged cross. And we see a man who was beating, beat, <coughs> spit upon, words of discouragement said to him. Yet he didn't open his mouth, but he went to a cross. And naked before the world, they nailed him on that cross and hung him up out there. And the world saw him, they pierced the side, he died on the cross, and they buried him. But did that stop Jesus Christ? Bible says three days, three nights later, he came forward to life. And I don't know about y'all, but that's encouragement to me. Amen. It's encouragement that I need to trust Jesus Christ because in Jesus Christ is power. In him is the ability to do. In him is the ability to be blessed. And our strength. Now, the second thing I want you to see is Haggai went straight to the problem of the Jews. How many of you go to the doctor when you're feeling sick and you want him to lie to you? Where do I go, right? You go to the doctor for a reason, don't you? You want to find out what's wrong with you and you want to get better. Brother Tony, have you seen any doctors in the last nine months? <laughs> and there's a reason you went, wasn't there? 
Absolutely. Because you have faced, I don't know how many different problems. One after the other, after the other, after the other. And I'm sure you're very discouraged right now. He's going, oh, Brother Tony, did you go there and say, hey, Bob, just lie to me? No, we go to the doctor for a reason. We want to find out our problem. And we're praying that the doctor knows how to help us. Right? Have any of you ever been to a doctor and he diagnosed you and later on to find out they were wrong? That's sad. That's sad. But can I tell you, God knew what was wrong with Israel. He knew what was wrong with these Jews. He said, hey guy, go tell them what's wrong so they can make it right and tell them how to get it right. Isn't that what you want? Isn't you, don't you want the truth told to you and the remedy given? Amen. That's what Haggai's doing. He's going to give them the truth. He's going to tell them. Can I tell you, as we go to the doctor, the doctor tells us what's wrong with us, and he tells us what needs to be done in order for us to be healed. We do it, we get healed, we feel better, don't we? Well, what if God points out your sin to you and tells you what's wrong and how to get it right. If you do it, you feel better. You're rejoicing, you're worshiping, you're praising God, and you're where you're supposed to be, right? But what if you don't? What if you hear the truth and you know what you're supposed to do and you don't do it? I'll tell you, if you're saved, you're still miserable and discouraged. So that guy has a job to tell the truth. Do you know a saint of God never gets right with God until they know they're in sin? And if you're right, if you're saved, and the Holy Ghost lives inside you, like the Bible says He does, then when you get convicted of sin, you know what's wrong and you need to do something about it, right? We should anyway. We're confronted with our sin. Now, in Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, we find their sin. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. Now, Haggai is doing the writing. Haggai is the one speaking to the Jews and all. But guess what he's saying? This is God's word. Can I tell you today? This is God's word. Don't look at the mouthpiece. Look at the author. Look at the one who says it. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying this people say, uh-oh, you're in trouble now. Because God knows exactly what we say, what we think, and what we feel. Huh? Ain't no denying it. But, 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 no buts about it. God knows. And God says, hey, I got to tell them, this people say, you said it? You're guilty, you're in sin, and you're wrong. From God. This people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. You're going to say, it's not time to build it. Sixteen years. They had a foundation, they've done nothing, but they did build the wall, they did build their houses, but now they say it's still not time to build a temple. But God sent them there to build it. Years before, God sent them to go back, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, rebuild your homes. But yet, they've done everything but rebuild that temple. Sixteen years they've been sitting fancy free up in their houses. In fact, they, in verse 4 it says, you're sitting in your sealed houses. That sealed houses mean their homes are built like mansions. Homes that the kings would live in. They're still, you built elegant houses, but you've not rebuilt the house of God. I've got a question for you. This one's got, got me stumbled. Where'd all that material come from to build their homes? Could have been all that material that God gave them to build the temple with? 
Maybe that's why Malachi wrote, Will a man rob God? I believe they stole the temple's material and built them some fine homes with that temple material and set fat and fancy free in that sealed fancy house of theirs. But the house of God is still undone. Huh? Something to think about it. They say it's not time to build. It's not. But you know, if you went back to Ezra chapter 3, it was reading over there, Ezra chapter 3, you'd find that God had already given them the charge to rebuild the temple. He'd already supplied all their needs. He'd already given them everything they had. But then you come to chapter 4, we found that they quit because they're discouraged. They weren't discouraged enough not to build their own homes, though, were they? They were only discouraged not to build the house of God. Or to worship. They begin to make excuses. You know, we make excuses today, don't we? We make excuses why we don't work for God. We make excuses why we don't witness to the laws. We make excuses why we don't invite anybody to church. We make excuses why we're not teaching a class or trying to help in some class or being involved in some class. We make excuses why we don't time. Oh, I can't afford to, preacher. I'm going to tell you something. I'll, I look here, most of us, most of y'all are on fixed income. You know what's funny? Um, Adrian Rogers, I heard him, a message they played of his the other day. He said, right now, he said, if, if all the people in this service, and I've been, I saw the building from the outside, Lord of mercy, you can put this building right here on the front porch of oh, that building. But he said, all y'all were senior adults on a fixed income. He said, we'd have more money right now than what we got coming in with all you working people and all you business owners and all you. We'd have more money coming in from those on a fixed income than you who can make big money. And I tell you, it's a, it's a shame when it's the senior adults who tie, who get $1,000 or so. Huh? Oh, I can't afford to. I don't know why. I can't afford not to. Amen. Amen. Making excuses, right? And that's where they're at. They're making excuses. And can I tell you, people make excuses for sin all the time. You can go throughout this where I've been here many, many years now, about close to 40 years I've been in this community in two different churches and knock on people's doors, witness different people, talk to different people. Can I tell you, you'll find somebody between here and Callahan to tell you, I don't go to church, it's because of Lee with He hurt my feelings. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, I know I've hurt a lot of people's feelings, but you know why? Because they put their feelings out there on their shoulder, and I called out their sin, and God dealt with them, and they blamed me for it. Yeah. By the way, you might need one of them. And it's just another excuse. Are you making excuses? For why you can't live for the Lord? Why you're still depressed and discouraged and down? Are you still making some excuse for that? Well, quit. Quit. I can say if you're grieving, give up your grief. I want to tell you something. Uh, I told Terry this other day. It's funny. I'll go out in my garden. My daddy loved the garden. I'll go out in my garden and I'll go. And in my mind, I'm saying, well, Dad, cucumbers are looking pretty good. Man, look at them tomatoes. I, I still think of my daddy. In my mind, I talked to him. The other day, I, now don't, nobody call no people in white suits to come get me. But day I found myself sitting in his rocking chair on his patio talking out loud. Well, Daddy, sure did miss you. I ain't saying there's nothing wrong with that. But when you make excuses, well, I can't go because my grandson who doesn't live with us has got to hang there. Mm -hmm. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't tie because I got to do this or do that. Quit making excuses 
for not being right with God. Holy Ghost is dealing with your heart probably right now. And you're thinking, I I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to do nothing. Can I tell you, if God's dealing with your heart, but you make no excuses. <clears throat> so, well, preacher, you'd be the only one to know if, if anybody knew. No, 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 no. God knows your heart better than you know your heart. Yeah. Amen. He does. Satan wants you discouraged. We have a prayer meeting. We move from Saturday night to Thursday night to give people more time Saturday to do what they want to do and so forth. We move to Thursday night. Everybody was coming on Saturday night, so let's move to Thursday night. You know, we got a prayer meeting. And we, we're praying. And I tell you, we're praying for everybody in our church. We do. We're praying for lost people. We're praying for a revival. Pray for our country. And we're, we're, we're praying for all kinds of people. It's a set aside prayer meeting. And, and you know what I thought about it? Oh, preacher, I go Sunday morning, I go Sunday night, I go Wednesday. I'm not going Thursday night. It's just a prayer meeting. Well, some of y'all may stay home and not come to the Lord's Supper because it's just the Lord's Supper. Can I tell you something? It's whenever the Christians set the world to the side and seek God that He stops us and takes and pays attention. My question is, why aren't you here on Thursday night? Are you not concerned with our spiritual condition of America, our world, King Drake Baptist Church, or your all, or your loved ones, those you know, are, are you not concerned with those? Then why don't you come Thursday night and pray for them? Well, preacher, are you going to call on me to pray? No. I don't know how many weeks we've been doing it, Miss Melba. But I know the men that will pray. And I'll ask them to start and say, if anybody wants to follow after them, you will. And if I have silence for so long, then I'll close in prayer. That's what we do. But you know what? We come here for a reason. It's because there's a need. We need to get back to God. Oh, you, well, preacher, it's not Wednesday night. Do you know how Wednesday night came about? War. Mm -hmm. War. Moms started going to the church praying for their children who were in war for their husbands who have gone to battle. That's how it is. Can I tell you? We're in a war. Yep. It's a spiritual war. We need to come and pray. We need to quit making excuses, folks. Here's the last thing. I'm going to move on. When Haggai was, was speaking to these Jews, 16 years after they laid the foundation, that these Jews had stopped their works. And you know what they quit working? You know what they were saying without saying this? And you think about it. Weren't they saying they had no faith in God? We don't believe God can protect us. We don't believe God's in this. We don't believe God wants us to do this. They had no faith in His Word because He's the one that told them to go back there and build. So they had no faith. Can I tell you, there's some of you don't have no faith in this Word either. Because see, in this Word, in this book, it tells us how to live as a child of God. It tells us how to trust Him. It tells us promises that He's made to us. All this book is filled with so many things. Yet, when we're not in the Word of God and when we're not serving and living for Him, we're saying we do not have any faith in the Word of God. They also, by not working, said they had no faith in His power. <clears throat> Has God's power diminished? Well, well, let's just think about the power of God for a minute. What did He do to create this planet? Spoke it yep. into existence. How many of y'all spoke anything to an existence? <laughs> I got a bunch of dirty clothes in the house. 
I'm going to just walk up to my closet where my dirty clothes is and say, Be clean! <laughs> you reckon that's going to happen? <laughs> no. Nah. Uh, some of you probably need to do some dusting in the house or vacuuming or sweeping, right? Maybe cut your grass. Go home this afternoon to pull in your yard and your grass needs to be cut and say, Be cut! And see how much power you have. And yet, we deny the power of God that spoke this planet into existence. We deny the power of God that parted the Red Sea and allowed His people to cross and destroy their enemies. We deny the power of God that sent His Son to a cross to die and Him spend three days and three nights in a tomb and then on that third day he arose. We're denying that power. That's where these Jews are. Because they weren't serving and doing what they were supposed to do. God had already used Isaiah and Jeremiah to tell these Jews, reveal, get to work, go do it. But they didn't do it. Because they were discouraged. <clears throat> Because their adversary told them they could. So they denied the power of God. They denied the word. Their problem was like ours. Or maybe I should say our problem today is just like theirs. In Matthew 6 33, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You know what our problem is today? We're seeking everything else that pleases us. But we're not seeking what pleases God. Amen. We're supposed to be seeking His righteousness. The things that are pleasing to Him. Paul told the church at Corinth, he said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. <clears throat> You're the person I find <clears throat> that seems to have God on their side and God working for them and God blessing them and doing things. Seems to be that person who served the Lord. The church that is working for God is also the growing church. Christian, you'll receive rewards if you will just take and serve the Lord. If you will worship Him. You know, God has supplied these Jews with everything they needed for the work of God. Do you know God supplied you with everything you need to do His work? Amen. He has supplied you with everything. Habakkuk 2.4 says, But the just shall live by his faith. How's your faith? How is our faith? You remember the woman who had the issue of blood? Brother Tony, you ever feel like you just want to reach over and grab the hem of his garment? Yeah, just touch it. It wasn't anything. didn't have to be spoken to. didn't have to be touched with his hand. And Jesus turned around and says, your faith has healed you. It's your faith. It's your faith. It's faith that brings us back to Jesus. That's what it is. Do you all remember the story in the New Testament? There was a master. And he was fixing to go off on a trip. And he had three servants. And the master came along and he gave so many talents to one, so much money to one, so much to another, and then very little to the last one. And he was going on his trip and he came back and the first servant that got most of the money had doubled his money. You remember that, that, that parable in the Bible? And then that second one doubled his money. But that last one took what God gave him and buried it in the dirt. You know what God did? God took the money that first one or the, the last one that had a little very little and give it to the first one. You know why? Because he took and used what God gave him 
to bring honor and glory to the master. The moral of the story is, if you want God's blessing, then take what God's given you and use it for him. Because if you don't, he'll take what he's given you and give it to somebody else. And you'll miss out on the blessings of the Lord. When God calls somebody to be saved, when God calls somebody to join this church, be a part of this church, you know what he never calls them to do? He never calls them to sit on a pew and do nothing. He always calls us to action. That's what he calls us to do. Whenever you were called to salvation, God was calling you to serve him. Do you know that when you got saved, you actually enlisted into the army of God? To be a servant of God. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible do I find where God told Israel to sit still and do nothing, or do I find him telling the church to sit, sit still and do nothing. In fact, I find him telling Israel, be busy about my work. Over in the New Testament, I find him telling the church, be busy about my work. Don't stop. I don't care if you're discouraged. Let's talk about your discouragement. Let's get it right. And let's move on. Because I will take care of you. You know what our excuses are? Sin. And that's just what God said, hey, God, it's sin. I'm sure some of you feel like the devil's got the best of you. And you're discouraged. I'm sure you feel discouraged. You feel now, can I tell you? Don't quit. Don't quit. God is so great. Don't let the devil discourage you to quit. Turn to Jesus. Look to Him. Get in His Word. Read His promises. Look at what He's done in the past to others. Look and see how He's blessed Israel. Look and see how He's blessed different people and all. Can I tell you, there was a time when Paul had been preaching in the city and they began to stone him and the men had to lift him out at night over a wall in a basket to escape. Can I tell you, you may feel like the devil is stoning you right now and that he's throwing rocks as hard as he can at you, but I want to tell you something. You might get out of there bruised, but I'll tell you what, you'll come out with your life because God will deliver you. Amen. Trust the Lord. Don't quit, sir. We need a spiritual revival. Can I tell you this? I can't have it for you. Nobody here can have a spiritual revival for you. The only one that's going to have a spiritual revival for you is you. I say this Thursday night. If we, and I talk to those who are in the perfect, that if we have a spiritual revival among us, it'll spread like wildfire throughout our church. We need it, don't we? Can I tell you this? If, it, if a revival spreads throughout this church and we get so excited about Jesus, people want to know what we got. They'll, want to know what, they'll come to find out. When you're talking to them, and you're excited, and, and they just see the glow of God on you. I'll tell you what happened. They won't want nothing. And you know what you'll do? You'll tell them about it. And then they'll come to King's Road Baptist Church and find out about it. And if we're having a spiritual revival, the Holy Spirit will be in the midst of this, and the lost will get saved. And the backslid will get right with God. Stop making excuses. God's not changed. The Bible says He's saying yesterday, today, and forever. He'll empower you. He'll give you your joy back. You do want to be like David. He had to pray, Lord, restore the joy of thy salvation. You may be there. But can I tell you, the only person who can do anything about this is you. It's you. We're going to have an invitation. And I believe God's spoken here today. 
Are you going to sit and turn a deaf ear and make another excuse? Or will you be down at the altar talking to God? It's all left up to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today through your word. God, help us to learn, Lord. God, help us to learn from what happened to Israel, what happened when the man of God spoke. Lord, I pray, God, that we get back to rebuilding our temple and build our spiritual relationship once again with you. Oh, God, I pray, Father, and ask you, Lord, just to do a mighty work. God, have your will and way in this invitation. I pray to you, God, give your people strength. Give them encouragement. Draw them closer to you, Lord. God, show your love to them and let them care. God, during this invitation, have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to ask.